This is an Anami podcast. Hello and welcome back to Growing Up with Devin Werkheiser. I am Devin Werkheiser. Um, here we are, guys. We're growing up. We're out here. We're living our lives. We're trying to figure out what being an adult is and what it means to us. And no matter how much we want to go back to our adolescent, no responsibility lives, we can't. So we got to keep forging ahead and finding meaning in our lives and finding ways to make it through when it, when it feels difficult. And I know that's been a journey for me. I'm sure it's been a journey for you. Um, I don't really have answers for you on this podcast, but I'm just here to explore it with you. You know, I, I have answers I've found, but they keep changing. Um, so I, I, you know, I, I, I don't have the, the keys for you. You have to find it. We all have to find it in our own lives, but I am happy to be able to, to explore these ideas with you and talk to great people about the ways they've transitioned um, into their adulthood, into new responsibilities, into choosing life paths and, and what to do. And today we have a great conversation with Reed Alexander. Um, I hadn't met Reed before, but we grew up in a similar era of Nickelodeon. Um, he was on iCarly, which was like just after Ned's was on. And so we come from a similar era of Nickelodeon, but while I have been out here continuing to pursue my dreams of, of movie stardom and uh, being a professional working actor, which has uh, you know been a long and difficult journey with a lot of rejection and losing my mind, uh, Reed went to college instead and uh, I think got a master's in journalism and he fully pivoted. He let go of the acting bug and, and really has, has followed an entirely new career path in journalism and he's been very successful in it. And it, it's been, a, it was a, a great to talk to him about that because when you grow up a kid actor, you watch some kids stay in it some kids find other paths that are fully a great career path and new passion. And some kids kind of land somewhere in between and, and get a little lost. Um, and I'm always interested to see where people go uh, when they grew up as kid actors. Um, so we talk about his love of journalism, um, his transition into that. Uh, we talk about the fact that even though he had given up acting, iCarly came back with a reboot. And so he's getting to continue acting on the reboot um, only because it was something that he was already on and loved and wanted to bring it back for the audience. Um, we talked about uh, that he doesn't want to continue acting necessarily. He really likes covering acting and other topics from the journalism side. I think journalism's a, a really important um, profession and vocation that's kind of wonky and under uh, uh, major transitions right now. So I really enjoyed getting to talk to someone who's in it. Uh, I hope you enjoy this conversation as well. I'm sure you will. Make sure you like, follow, and subscribe. Thanks for being here. Love you. This episode is brought to you by Better Help. Look, when you're feeling your best, Life can feel easy, you're flowing, you're handling your business, it's all good. But if you're like me, you're not always feeling that way. Sometimes you're feeling stuck and you don't know what it is and you don't know how to get through it. Well, therapy can help provide that clarity. I personally have a therapist. I call him when I need him. I call him when I feel stuck, when I feel knotted up and, and I don't know how to get through to that empowered self and he helps. Honestly, I, I, I don't know where I'd be without therapy. So if you're thinking of giving therapy a try, BetterHelp is a great option for you. It's convenient, it's flexible, it's affordable, and it's entirely online. You don't even have to leave your house. So if you want to live a more empowered life, therapy can help get you there. Visit betterhelp.com slash growdevin today to get 10% off your first month. That's betterhelp, H-E-L-P.com slash 
Devon, D-E-V-O-N. Today we have Reed Alexander. It's very good to be here. Thank you so much for having me. Reed, former child star, now journalist. You have a master's. I can't wait to get into it. I'm impressed by your life's journey, and I'm I'm glad you're here. I'm so excited to be um, a guest on your new amazing show. Yes. And guilty as charged to all of those things you said. So let's do this. So you you were you're on and we're on iCarly. Yeah. Um yeah. my first question is how the fuck does it feel to have a reboot? <laughs> it is wild. I mean, it was so, so fun to be a part of the revival series. And in fact, for so many years, um, you know, people have asked us and come up to us, as I'm sure they've come up to you and said, is there a chance, you know, will you get back together? And for a long, long time, I thought perhaps uh, it would be some sort of a film, like an iCarly reunion film, yes. because they did that with Drake and Josh yep. and some of the other shows. Um, but when the opportunity arose to do this reboot on Paramount+, Plus, I think everybody was incredibly enthusiastic about revisiting some of these characters. And I think each of us has been at a different sort of place in our lives. You know, for me, I've pursued a new career as a journalist, as you know. Um, the others, some, I mean, Nathan has been very prolific as a director, and he really did a lot on Game Shakers and Henry Danger. Miranda has had incredibly successful films like Despicable Me. So it's been interesting to see what everybody's done in the intervening, you know, nearly a decade. Mm -hmm. The show ended, I want to say 2012, 2013, the mm -hmm. original show, and came out last year. And uh, I mean, the response has been great. So I think it's been fun for all parties involved. Yeah, well, and it's cool to revisit it uh, as adults too. You guys yeah. get to like, cover some adult themes, say some swear words, you know, you're not. It is different. I remember, you know, seeing some of the scripts uh, and obviously watching along with everyone else and seeing, you know, slightly different vocabulary choice. But as our viewers, those core viewers have grown up, um, you know, I guess we're growing up with them. I think the other thing that's interesting, and you'll probably feel the same, is you know, they rerun the original show quite a lot. And For now sure. it's on Netflix and it's easy to find. So there's this whole other generation of viewers of the OG iCarly, um, you know, the next sort of up and coming constituency of iCarly fans that still come up and talk to us, you know, younger kids. Yeah. And they will also grow into the revival. Yes. So in a way, we're able to sort of hold their hand over the course of a number of years. And I think that's a unique opportunity in television. There are a lot of revivals, but there are a lot more shows that don't get brought back. For sure. And like, like I mine. Well, <laughs> listen, you're also on to plenty of other very cool things. You have your own show, and this show is yes. going to be around for a long time. That's right. That's and you're right. going to have a lot of airtime and a lot of really great conversations. No, but I think what's interesting, you know, is our show launched in 2007, and I was giving a lot of thought to this in recent years as TikTok and Instagram have become such popular platforms for people to develop their own content. When iCarly came out in 2007, People knew what a web show was, and some people were thinking about a web show. But it was a really important moment in the industry because I, who had started acting, I think in 2002, so this is way back in the day, 20 mm -hmm. years ago when I was like seven, eight years old, and I'm going to be 28 in a couple of weeks. Um, you know, there was so much talk in the industry around 2005, 6, 7, as you will recall, about how it was transforming and how everything was going digital and everyone would have a platform online and there were so many new platforms to create content. And iCarly was both a reaction to that, but I also think a very prescient view down the road about where content was going. And now, you know, 10 years later, that is like the zeitgeist is, do you have a TikTok presence? Do you have your own YouTube channel? And we kind of touched home plate first, I think. And For sure. And I think it's part of the reason why this show has had such cultural staying power was we, I do believe, empowered a lot of viewers out there at home to say, gosh, you know, this character Carly has her own web show. Maybe I could try doing some things. For real. And I mean, that since 2007, I mean. It exploded. Yeah. Ned's missed all social media. Like Twitter had just launched when we were done, I think. Like, yeah. Like yeah, we 2006, missed, we right? Missed, exactly. We yeah. missed the whole thing. And then to watch what's happening. I mean, it is fully integrated into all of our lives, especially entertainers um, and especially the younger generation. Like everybody yeah. is creating. And TikTok really changed things because now everybody can create. YouTube, Vine, people did it. 
people were able to find some success, but TikTok's algorithm, you can yeah. you can actually get some numbers. Anybody, it's anybody wild. can find it. TikTok has really changed the game, I yeah, think. I and agree. I think now it has really surpassed. I mean, I haven't really looked at the data as much as maybe I should because I report on the media sector. So perhaps I should look at some of the more recent uh, stats. But in my view, in terms of the power of having a TikTok presence. Like that's where it's at. Yep. You know, Twitter is really it's good for people like me, you know, journalists, yeah, but it does very sphere. little. Yeah, I think actually it's more valuable because so many people are on there just talking about different things that could lead to stories. Sure. But like if you're a creator, I think TikTok's where it's at. I, I it's agree. a tough time for TikTok too, not to like take us off course, but of course you read all the headlines about yeah, security and privacy. Sure. So big questions, I think, about how the most powerful content platform for some of these young people is going to age up into having to reconcile with real questions about privacy and security. So for sure. Oh, look, I geek out over this. Yeah. I'm sure like viewers will find other topics more interesting no, than listening I think, to me regurgitate this. No, stuff, I but. think we're all deep in it. We're all wondering these things. And yeah. I wanted to ask about your your journalism, your media. So when yeah. when iCarly, when the reboot came about, yeah. um, you had already fully moved into a yeah. whole other career. Yeah. You got a master's in journalism, right? Yeah, From I Columbia. Did, yeah. mm -hmm. Right. So <laughs> had you ha, had you like let go of acting entirely and it's yeah. just because iCarly yeah. that you're back? Yeah, totally. I mean, I had been you know, very clear with people that when I left uh, the show originally and went to NYU for undergrad, I, you know, acting was not something that I thought I would do again. Um, and that was completely my own choice. And yeah. it started when I was, gosh, probably like 15 or 16 on the original show because through that show, I was able, I was really lucky to do a series of things, which was to write a book and to spend a lot of time going on the Today Show and some of the other morning shows out there and get to know journalists from CNN and even Sky News in the UK. And, mm. you know, by being around a lot of broadcast reporters when the original show was on, because you have to remember, I don't come from like a journalistic family. You know, my parents are attorneys and, you know, had I never been in acting, I probably would have been doing that. Where are you um, from? From South Florida, from Palm Beach, Florida. Palm Beach. Yeah, so another warm weather, sunny place. Yes, except sir. your weather on the West Coast is way better than, yes, it is. than humid Florida we weather. We don't play with that humidity. No, mm -hmm. and you're lucky because it really makes things miserable. Yes, it does. <laughs> <laughs> it makes things miserable. But um, I, uh, you know, and you're from Texas. Georgia. Georgia, yes. Another sort of another warm weather Another Yes, mm -hmm. exactly. So you understand from experience. I know about the South, my friend. <laughs> and you have the accent nailed. Um, <laughs> you do, you do. Um, um, yeah, when the show was going on, you know, through that show, I was around so many reporters. And yeah. what I thought was, you know, I think when people hear that I sort of transitioned out of this industry and moved into, you know, the journalism industry, it sounds like such a hard turn to people. But when I think about it, it makes perfect sense to me because I always wanted to live a really public facing life whether it was in acting or whatever it was, it certainly wasn't going to be music. I have no such <laughs> talents as you have in that department, <laughs> thank you, thank um, you. which I have a great deal of admiration for. But I knew that I would live some sort of a public-facing life. Mm. And I'm also a pretty serious-minded person generally, and I'm very interested in the news and travel. And I was traveling a lot, and I was around journalists. So I thought, gosh, you know, they just seem to have the most thrilling careers because when they're done talking to, you know, people like me or whomever, and we're out of there and cleared out, they have a laundry list of fascinating people, very much like you were doing with this show, having yeah. really smart conversations with fascinating people. And at that point in time, you know, 10, 12 years ago that I started thinking maybe journalism is an avenue for me because I like asking questions and I like sort of leading the conversation and pulling out interesting parts of people's lives. Simply the notion of just meeting fascinating people was for me, you know, everything and that sold it. I was not thinking about like real reporting, investigative reporting, deep dive reporting, you know, the kind of reporting where you have sources that only you know the identity of the person yeah. and are fact checking and verifying or yeah. obtaining documents or leaked records. I just wasn't thinking that way. But I knew that journalism seemed like a very rich and scintillating life. So I started thinking, you know, if I don't want to be an acting forever, which to be honest, I didn't. You know, at that point, I was starting to think, I love doing the show, but like, you know, when something, 
is sort of on the way out for you when you don't wake up every morning. And yes, every job has its own frustrations and journalism does for me at times. But when you lose the spark and the yep. excitement and the joy and like, look, I was getting copies of scripts and things and my agent would call and say, we have this role and we have this role and you could audition for this. And I was like, nah, nah, nah. Do I really want to go to this audition? Do I really want to think about playing this part that I don't like very much? And when you, it's not just being selective. It's like losing the spark. Yeah, you lost the love. I lost the love for this I, and I, I fell out of love that. with it. Yeah. Which I will say is very tough to do when you are a teenager. And I think you may understand this in a way that very few others will not, and you associate your whole identity with something. For sure. And listen, I mean, at 12 years old, it is not normal to have a career. No, it's not. Or a job or a professional profile. But you and I, who were young in the industry, would tell people, I'm an actor. And what happens when you say something 9,000 times, you, you start to believe it. identity. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Who you are. Yeah. So for me to then think around the teenage years, you know, am I going to really part ways with saying, like, what am I even going to be? I'm, I'm a former actor. Like, right. what, what's that going to sound like? That sounds terrible. Right. Like, being ashamed of oneself. So I thought, no, if I'm going to do this, I've got to do this. And there was fear there. But I realized, okay, if I really don't want to or don't see a future living the life of an actor, I'm going to have to figure out something else really great that's going to keep me personally satisfied. <clears throat> so that's when I started thinking journalism. That actually makes sense to me. Like when uh, our friend Sophie Barron. Yeah. Uh, shout out. Shout out mutual. Sophie <laughs> to our mutual who set this up. Yeah. Um, when she told me you were in town and I could interview you. Which I was so grateful for the chance to do. Yes. And like thanks to Sophie. But uh, yeah, I was so interested in knowing that we came from this similar yeah. childhood Nickelodeon show experience. Yeah. But then to see you like fully went down a different career. Um, seeing it was journalism, that made sense to me. Some yeah. aspect of going from act, kid actor yeah. into journalism, I get that overlap. I get that publicness. I get that it's stories, curiosity, right? stories, yeah. meeting other people. Um, it's a public-facing life, yes. and at the heart of it is story. And I think the difference is, you know, I was playing a part in a broader story that was written you know, for all of us in any, you know, show or yeah. production or film you're part of. But now I have much more of a chance to think about how to frame the story. The, the crucial difference, though, is I'm not writing in fiction. So in exactly. a way, I can't be – I don't have the creative liberties that, say, a screenplay writer has that you could sort of invent someone or your plot armor or whatever. Sure. Or, you know, someone falls out of the sky – you know, for me, the stories that I tell now are very rigidly defined, but the creativity comes in in both big ways and small ways. In big ways, in thinking about framing or what does this story say about a deeper issue or, you know, how are we going to go about reporting this story creatively if there are so many obstacles to finding things out? And in small ways, like how do we pull the reader in with word choice and syntax and what's the pacing and what's the structure and what's a really great lead for this or what are these stunning quotes that just take your breath away? Yeah. And those are the same kinds of things I was dealing with as an actor. For sure. But I have so much more control over it in my own life mm. now as a journalist. So, you know, that kind of explains the switch and that's why I was thinking of doing it. You know, the rest is history and we can go into everything that happened next, but at least that was the sort of crucial time that I thought about making a change and I'm lucky because I actually think there are a lot of people in any industry who could see themselves doing something else and for whatever reason, it's not possible. Yeah. The funny thing is, in the industry that you and I have been in for so many years, I think everybody, this is my theory, at one point or another, thinks, what if I was a singer or a musician? Sure. Or what if I was an actor? Everybody thinks that sure. on this planet. Sure. What if I was on it is in a movie? You know, right. what if I was on the what silver if I did screen? That? Yeah. What if I could be on television? What would that be like? Yep. My life could be everybody thinks this For sure. in a way that maybe they don't think with every other job. Yeah. Um, you know, so I feel lucky to have gotten to experience, I think, like one of the world's coolest jobs to be an actor, to be someone who can bring a character to life. But in the same way, I feel very settled with the decision to have moved on from that and pursued this other thing. Yeah, I love the clarity. I mean, you went and got a master's and are fully on the journalism thing. And then yeah. that's kind of amazing and kismet that like iCarly <laughs> comes back and you get this little like yeah. revival to stay in the industry in yeah. some way. Yeah, yeah. Um, but yeah. I, I respect the child actors who get out. And well, you because know. Because I've been pursuing it since then. And I still, like, it's still the only thing I want to do. Well, creative things in general are it's still the only like path for me and and uh turning 30 it's like I had to look at am I still gonna keep like am I yeah. crazy to keep I think pursuing you have to, this thing you really love it 
I, I do. And at 30, I was like, at this point, like maybe I could have gone to college and switched careers, but at this point, I'm fully in. It's the only thing I've like, I've trained myself to be and do my entire life. I gotta fucking stay in this. In a way, you're lucky because you know, it's not a bad place to be. To have to be an actor is a kind of cool thing. Yeah. Um, and you don't have to be anything. But what I would I say know. is you said something very interesting to Sophie when I was listening to your interview, which was that in all the places you've been, you have felt most, you know, alive or at home or yourself or happiest on a set, yep. on a soundstage. Yep. And I got to tell you, when I walk onto one, either, you know, when it was the revival of the show or – you know, as myself, just as a person, I've visited sets, sure. you know, people I've known, whatever, in New York or out here over the years. There is something pretty remarkable about it. Like, let's face oh, it. There's you a know? magic, yeah. man. Yeah. There's a magic. Yeah. And I, like, yeah. crave it every day I'm not yeah. on a set. Well, you are on a set now. I mean, now yes. you have your own set. Like, yes. I'm pretty jealous. Yes, no. You should see my digs when <laughs> I do interviews. Now I have a comp I have my Mac yeah, a little... and a ring light. Yep. Yep. <laughs> this is way more pro. Yes, no. The studio's cool and podcasting is cool, but it's not the same as being on a soundstage, even if I'm hanging a left at the nudie store in the valley. <laughs> going to shoot Neds. Even yeah, if I'm going to shoot yeah, Neds yeah. out in North Hollywood, man. Yeah, like yeah, yeah. I I long for those days on a set in the, like it's a circus. It's a crazy energy and it's a crazy magic. It's a wild place to be. And I do always wonder if I would have loved it as much if I wasn't an actor. Because for us, I mean, as you well know, we really are the lucky ones on set because, yes. you know, we get like, you know, perks and yeah, prims get spoiled. and, and yeah. you know, everybody is doing everything to keep us happy and we get our own sort of room to chillax yeah, in. Yeah, and, yeah, yeah. You know, we have, you know, eight different people assigned to make us look good and get us water. You know, it's unbelievable. Yeah, it's I mean, crazy. anything you could want as an actor, it's anything crazy. you could want, you know, is there for you. And I remember it was so funny because there was a time once when I just felt like this jacket, you know, from wardrobe was just kind of big. And I think I had gone to like a wardrobe, you know, person and I said, is there anything we can do in 10 minutes? In 10, I was like, I can get something back from my tailor at home. It takes 14 days I to get a pair of pants shortened. <laughs> I mean, anything you could possibly want. Mm -hmm. It's like this. So I've always wondered if I was there in a different capacity. Would you, you know, love it as much? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I think there would be amazing things. Like, yeah. you know, you'd be there as a production assistant or an assistant director and say like, man, this is a really cool place to be. There are way worse places to work. For sure. But it's a hustle from what I can tell. Oh, don't yeah, you think? A, well, for sure it's a hustle. I mean, we work 12 hours, 12 hour days. Like, yeah. like reg, that's minimum regular. Yeah. I don't know any production that isn't a 12 hour day. Yeah. Um, and then actors just like get in their car and go home. But yeah. PAs work well over 12 hours. Yeah. They're there before everyone. Very they're there long after. Days. They're up at four in the morning. Long days, a yeah. lot of stress, a lot of moving parts. But see, for me, it's like I... I, I've done some of those jobs. I help out when I'm on set. Like, I, I still love even that aspect of it. The yeah. major kind of problem solving, moving parts, a hundred different people, a hundred different departments. Like, I love it. I think it's, it's so cool. I think it's such there's a- There's nothing like it. There's, there's nothing like it. Yeah. yeah. And I feel about that the same way I feel about journalism, which is it is- one of the most incredible inventions of like humanity. Mm. And I know that sounds really extra, mm. but I really mean it. You know, mm. we are a species that has come up with something as incredible as a soundstage, as a yeah. Hollywood production, as being able to create films and television shows that really move people and can move you to your core. And we've created this other, you know, incredible invention, which is journalism, which is really capturing these crucial stories that say something and sort of archive history, archive parts of our human experience. And it actually makes me feel really good that, like, as people, we've come up with these things. Because there's plenty that's wrong with the world. For sure. But I think you and I have been lucky to experience a lot that's right. You for know? sure. And, I, and a lot of that, for me, has also happened on the soundstage. So there's parts that I miss. Yeah. I mean, don't get me wrong. I'm excited because, you know, this was a really exciting year just in my journalism career. I spent the past few years covering Wall Street, as it happens. And that surprises people that I covered the finance industry and I covered big banks and I covered, you know, Goldman Sachs and J.P. Morgan. Oh, goodness. And yeah, it was really very thrilling. I wasn't covering markets, you know, like stocks up, stocks down. It was okay. much more like investigating the sort of powerful software system that J.P. Morgan invented to watch their quarter million employees and everything they do at work. Wow, okay. Or getting inside Goldman and understanding what the life and times of being, you know, a 22-year-old, 23-year-old junior investment banker, you know, working 100-hour weeks, running around New York City to wild parties and then having to be in the office at five in the morning, you know, what that is like. Goodness. But, but I have spent the past years really trying to 
get back to the entertainment industry as a journalist covering it. And not covering celebrities either. Yeah. Covering the real business side, covering the streamers, you know, covering Netflix and Apple and Amazon and Disney and, and understand what moves they're making. What moves yeah. are they making? What projects are they green lighting? How are they sort of growing their subscriber bases? What's happening is they're introducing ad tiers onto the platform. And how could that impact content and showrunners out sure. in Hollywood? And now that's what I'm doing. You know, Amazing. I'm now covering the media industry, the entertainment industry. So for me, it's this sort of strange like homecoming Yeah, to come back to this and to call old friends and people I've known in the industry and agents and managers, what have you, and say, you know, what's happened the past 10 years? Bring wow. me up to speed. Take me inside how the industry works. So I'm very fired up that 2023 is going to be a sort of unique homecoming. Yeah. And I think maybe this was the beat that I was meant to be on all this time. Right, right. <laughs> Having grown up doing this. Um, but coming back to it as a journalist in my new identity, I just, I, I'm very I think that's that. so cool, man. I mean, there's like a whole life cycle of like, we, we don't always know where life's going to lead us or where yeah. our desires, our dreams are going to lead us. Yeah. And that's a really interesting one to have started in the industry and come back, fall to in it. love with journalism Isn't and now it? come back to it as a journalist and not an actor. Yeah. Like, yeah, I think it's amazing. And I think I'm really hoping to lean into the experiences I did have to understand the industry in a different way. You know, there's not a lot of reporters that have, you know, been, been in it and then of covering course this. Not. Of course I not. think like what I'm hoping it will do is it will allow me to understand sort of those negative spaces that often get missed. Like what actually goes on on a production. You know, if I'm looking yeah. into what's going on with a production company or a streamer or a studio, there's a lot you have to get up to speed on to yeah. really understand the contours of a story. For sure. And hopefully a lot of that learning curve is mitigated. But the industry has changed so much and too. Is changing constantly by the second. Yeah, by the uh, by like the really. Second. I mean, it's unbelievable, unbelievable. Since, since we've been on Nickelodeon, those yeah. twenty years since social media came yeah. out, since streamers came out and changed everything, yeah. since TV kind of took over the main trunk of storytelling that movies used to hold. Yeah. Like, it continues to change, and now Netflix, I guess, hit a peak and is now. Coming down off their Things mountain top, for, growth, yeah, for their first yeah. time in yeah. forever. It was a really like, shocking year for Netflix. E exactly, yeah. and and the whole industry is continuing to evolve in front of us. Um, I have no grasp on it. No. I hope. I hope. <laughs> I very much doubt that you are in the thick of it. I hope I have you not have been for a long time. Yeah, but you're on the journalist side. I hope you have some grasp on what's I happening. I better have some sense yeah. of things to do this job. <laughs> exactly. I would say, you know, one of the things that was really striking for me was because you know I'm a business insider. Um, you know, recently at Insider, we had our first ever rising stars of the entertainment industry list, okay. and it's not rising stars as actors. We have a lot of coverage of, sure. you know, talent. Yeah. But it's rising star execs, you know, wow. who are the movers and shakers at the streamers, at the production companies, at HBO, at, uh, you know, Lucasfilm, at Amazon, at Apple, at Netflix, what have you, at Disney, that are really driving innovation in the industry. Yes. And are calling the shots or the kind of point executives on shows that are really hot shows. Yeah. So it gives us a chance to get to know sort of the broader entertainment ecosystem of like decision makers. And one of the things that I asked of these casting directors I got to speak to, because we featured, I think, one of the casting directors from Sony um, and from Bloomhouse, the production company yep. Bloomhouse. They're very, yep. very good. Uh, two of their casting directors. And it was really fun for me to interview these people after, you know. God, years, years of auditioning. And by the them. way, mm -hmm. when they were very intimidating for me too. For sure. For <laughs> like, sure. you know, you'd go in and sort of shake and tremble, you know, hopefully I can please these people. Oh, and for sure. Have a future with this project. Their life is in your hands. Um, like in many cases. Please like Literally, me. you know, yeah. of course, you know, some people come here from, you know, all different places and their family is at home and it's a huge sacrifice. For sure. And, you know, these are the gatekeepers. Um, and I just said to them, like, you know, in all honesty, I was in this years ago. How has the pandemic changed things for you? And something that was so striking to me, and it makes sense, was like every industry went virtual. You know, people yep. were working from home. Everybody had these virtual advancements. But for casting, it was always – when you and I were at it, we were up against hundreds of people. You probably – beat out thousands of people, if not Ned, more, for yeah. Neds. Thousands. I'm sure there was a nationwide search, coast to coast. When you find the lead of a show, you know how it is. Right. No stone is left unturned. Right. Thousands and thousands of people. Now, now, they can see people globally. It's not just even people all across the country, in Canada, whatever. It's all around the world. They can get even hundreds of more tapes. Auditions are done. I mean, how do you compete with that? Like, that, that's mind-blowing. That makes me more upset. <laughs> I think for talent, it's very tough. Now, the yeah. counter argument is, well, maybe it's easier because there are more platforms. 
you know, I, I don't really buy that. No, no. I don't think that's true. I don't think there are so many more platforms. There may be fewer linear TV channels right. that are green lighting things. But you know what? There's not endless numbers of streaming shows. No, there isn't. And okay, if you consider TikTok and Instagram a platform, but guess what? Half the talent living out here is not paying the rent and, you know, paying for dinner tonight by posting on Instagram. They sure. want to be the lead of a show or a series yeah. regular on a show. And when you're up against exponentially larger pools of competition because COVID has enabled the studios to see that many more people, like more power for the studios that can see a bigger pool of people. But how much tougher is that if you're trying to break in? It's well, unbelievable. Well, and also everything's uh, an audition tape now, which mm. ha has pros and cons. Mm. I, I like the fact that I can film my own takes. Yeah. You know, I can pick a good take. Yeah. I love that. However, then they're just getting this sterile image that you're sending of totally. the project they're missing that that personal chat you know yeah the thing where you just on. get a feel for someone and you go yeah. yeah them actually beyond what they did of course you need a base level you need to act well yeah but beyond that i think i think often i was getting cast off like what happened in the room with people oh, yeah. and now oh, that's yeah. all gone now they just have to pick based on the yeah the tape you know i got iCarly off a of tape which was crazy. And sometimes I think like, what if I hadn't done? That was the only role mm. I ever booked on tape. You know, a show that I was on before iCarly was Will and Grace, the original Will and Grace. Amazing. Which also got revived. I didn't do that one. Yep. Um, and that was from going in there and doing the audition. And yeah. I think that was really crucial to have that feeling, that energy in yeah. the room where they can get a feel for you and you can get a feel for them. And yeah, they know like this it. is the person. It's you know? been years yeah, I miss it. I'm sure. Even, even pre-COVID, everything was moving was towards Was starting tapes. to become yeah. this way. See, yeah, I miss just all, That's interesting to me to hear because yeah. by then I was knee deep in, you know, in journalism. But I think for iCarly, I, I was in New York. It was a summer in New York and the show came out, I want to say September 2007, but who's counting? <laughs> Can you imagine <laughs> I knew like the date and the hour? <laughs> it's a little too much. Um, but it was that summer and I happened to be in New York City for the summer and I went to a studio you know, somewhere down in like Soho uh, to record this tape. And I'm just straight off the tape, it worked out. And sometimes I think, which is rare, as you know. Yeah, for sure. And sometimes I think like, what if I had been sick or what if I hadn't done it? You know, that yeah. show really changed my life. Yeah. So would there have been another production or would it all just kind of fizzled? And, right. You know, like I, you probably feel the same about for things sure. in your life. Oh, but, there, you I know, mean, you there's a timing up. and a magic and a grace to this industry. It's not yeah. just... I mean, you need the universe to open to you in the right with the right people and the right timing. Like there really is something ethereal about pursuing acting, you know, pursuing to it, entertainment. In this way, as a journalist, it's a real relief in many ways. And I'll tell you why, because and this is part of the allure for me of journalism. I always say to people, you know, I teach a journalism class. Did you know that? No. At University of Miami, I teach an undergrad reporting class. It's amazing. And I say to people, we meet people either at the pinnacle of success or at the nadir of success generally. Sometimes we meet people in between, yeah. you know, if there are sources on a story or something. But typically if you're sort of profiling someone, sure. they're either – they've never been hotter or they're really going through a struggle. Yeah. And as journalists, those gray areas, the in-between area, it's not usually that interesting for, for us. Sure. We're typically trying to find the outliers of like extreme cases. And as an actor, you're always trying to avoid the nadir and get to the pinnacle of success, the zenith of your power, success or influence or fame or whatever it is, or just ability to work. To work, yeah, And exactly. it's so, so, so hard. For journalists, our job is always to find and engage people who are doing decently well. And we cannot ignore those who aren't. You know, I'm, I actually feel very strongly about this. But to come to it and not have the pressure of having to like worry, am I going to stay in the industry? Am I going to be purged from the industry tomorrow? Like, is this the last? I can't tell you how many friends I've had that have gone on to do fairly well who have been like, there was a moment where – I was ditching the industry and it was the last audition, but then I got yeah. it and I got yeah, back I've in. Yeah, heard that story a million, a million times. times. Yeah, right. People that are like right on the, you know, it's a yeah. hair trigger between it's giving over giving it up or... entirely. <laughs> yes, and like moving away. Yeah, you know, taking some job somewhere. But um, to know that, like, I'll get to still be here in the industry, covering it in some way, even if I'm not in it. Because yeah. you know, you have to make choices, right? I'm For choosing sure. not to be 
in the trenches as an actor or director or whatever, but to know that at least I'll still get to be there and have a slice of it as someone capturing those stories or telling those stories and not have to worry about the pressure. Because as journalists, no one gets to decide if you're at the party. Like you're just, you're there. You're at the party, you know? yeah. That's the, that's the reality of the situation. No one can tell us to really go away because the harder you report, the more aggressively you report, you will get into those systems and break those stories and you will come in by force, either by invitation or by force. Right. So to know that and have that security after all these years yeah. and to have done it in this different role, there's something quite reassuring about that. I, I love that. Yeah, that I mean, that's a difficult part of the acting industry in general is no matter how long you've been doing it, no matter how good you are, it might not ever come to you. It, Unfortunately. It doesn't owe you. It, yeah. It's just not how it works. Yeah. Other people come along. The industry changes. Like, it does not matter. You have to find it in the moment every time and get lucky every time. Yeah. For other career paths, I feel like you go, you get good at it. While you're getting good at it, you meet people, mm -hmm. you meet your network. Mm -hmm. And as long as you stay in it and are good and keep getting better, you will progress. I think that's so true. Like I, it's almost if you're doing fairly well and you're showing up and you're not like slacking off yes, and you're meeting people, you're gonna it's, it's gonna kind of expand. Like baked in. Yes. You're gonna eventually get promoted and this and get the raise. But you're so right, and I often think like how much great talent, and this is just the reality of the world, and it's unfortunate, but how much great talent never really gets to be realized or seen or enjoyed or appreciated by the wider world. And for those people, you know, how much of their gifts fizzle and yeah. just kind of fade away. It's yeah. very sad, actually. I've, I've felt it at times in my life. Like I felt times where I felt so in my potential and mm. so in – what I can be as an artist and as a human, but not getting the opportunities to really do it and yeah. show it. And then I've gone through times where I'm like, it's so far away now. I don't even know. I don't know if it's still there. I don't like. Oh, it's still there for you, most definitely. I mean, you are so in it. You know, for, you've had a lot of different roles, and now you have this platform. Like, yeah, this is a new fun one. This is the podcast be is a new fun cool. one. I yeah. am calling, by the way, a prediction that this is going to be like when people come to town, they're going to want to be on this. I show. love that. Thanks, man. <laughs> I love that prediction. That's what we want it to be. I mean, I I am so curious. I'm so curious about humans yeah. and yeah. and all of us and all of our journeys because we have overlap, we have things we relate on, and we have all of our differences and nuances. So I yeah. hope this can be a place where I get to talk yeah. to a ton of different people. It will. it will. And that's journalistic. And I mean, you yes. understand the same instinct that I did, which is the chance to meet fascinating people and to have some ownership over how you tell their stories by yes. getting to sit down with them and ask these questions and pull it out of them in a way. Yes. You know, the fascinating color. Yeah. And so, look, we, we said the acting industry is changing, the entertainment industry is changing, which it is, but so is journalism. You're, huh. You came out of your master's program in 2020, right? Yeah. Mm -hmm. in I the mean, depth, in the dark years of COVID. I was, yeah, I mean, but in you, the you're, of COVID. you're coming into <laughs> journalism at a time where the business of journalism is super in flux. Yeah. And, and under I mean, attack in many ways. I was going to yeah. say, and under attack. I mean, there's such a saturation of it. There's so yeah. much of it. But now there's so much distrust yeah. of what, a very big problem. what truth is. I mean, we live in a fucking post-factual world, which yeah. I can't believe that's a thing. I know. Isn't that shocking? We live in a world where facts don't hold the value that they should anymore. It's very alarming. It's yeah. very alarming. And the onus is on us now as journalists who are occupying this role to really prove why we are here and the utility that we have to offer, but not just to do the best reporting we can do and to prove that we are an essential service or an essential tool or resource for people, but to be really clear and transparent to the extent possible about our methods. And mm. I think a big problem was for many, many years, we in the news industry just assumed that if you picked up, you know, the copy of the Sunday New York Times or whatever, and you start reading through and flipping through and find an article – that you believe everything that's true because the Times wrote it or a publication wrote it. Just because someone says something does not make it true, which is evidenced by what you just said. You know, their facts are open to interpretation, which is very unfortunate. But even for journalists, we can't expect that because you came to our website, because you came to Insider, you came to the Washington Post, you came to whatever, 
that you should then ascribe full belief and confidence in what you're reading because we said it's true. Mm-hmm. We've well, got to show people in the writing, even if it's small things like multiple people with direct knowledge because they were either in the room yes. or they attended the meeting or here's a copy of the document. Yeah. We've got to show the receipts in a way that we've never had to before y- to get people to believe. Yeah, that's been the hard thing uh, watching this kind of like breakdown of trust in journalism, in institutions is like... <sighs> There, there were so many examples and so much evidence to of why you should distrust the institutions. <laughs> There's so many examples of journalists not being ethical, right. of stories being reported on that were opinion and not truth, that Very weren't so. well reported on, but were under this banner of, of major institution yeah. and with kind of uh, an arrogance to them. Yeah. And so it's like, I get, I get why people have these these examples of why you should distrust some of the institutions and media, but you can't give it up absolutely and entirely. And of course there's gray area. And of course there's people still reporting with ethics and and you have to know that. The way people have given up all trust of institutions and yet they'll give full trust to some random person on YouTube saying whatever Someone tweeting about something yeah anonymously I know just yeah. because it's counter mainstream doesn't Reddit. mean it's more <laughs> trustworthy like I get have reasonable doubt but yeah we, we this has been a crazy couple years watching not as a journalist but just as a citizen a and as a human of information yeah, yeah and a consumer mm-hmm. of information and yeah. someone who I, I do seek truth yeah I yeah. do think there has to be truth out yeah. there. It's not all gray and we can't be post-factual. There is objective reality. Um, but you are entering journalism right in the thick yeah. of... A complicated time. A complicated time. And it's compounded by the fact that right now, you know, the media industry and specifically newsrooms and journalists, you know, there's a lot of layoffs going on. And we've been fortunate at, you know, my publication to have found ways to steer through a difficult economy. But, you know, just this week, I've seen stories about 400 layoffs at CNN, um, you know, NBC Universal, NBC News is experiencing layoff. Like, no one is immune. No one is immune. BuzzFeed, Morning Brew. There are layoffs happening left and right in newsrooms. And it's really, really unfortunate to see. You know, I will say what's interesting from where I sit. So I, gosh, I graduated undergrad in 2017 and I went to work for, uh, actually before even that, I was, I moved to Hong Kong and I worked for CNN International, which was very, very cool and got to write my very first stories for CNN. Um, And then I moved back to the US and I joined uh, Dow Jones, like Wall Street Journal Digital Network and spent a year there. Then I got this editor position and it was when I was an editor that I realized, you know, I have a lot to learn about sort of the higher art of investigative reporting and how to sort of coach and mentor reporters. So that's when I went back to grad school. Hmm. So I got a little bit of journalism a couple of years before the master's program. And my master's program was a real turning point because COVID happened and we saw layoffs and, you know, job losses and unemployment unlike we've ever seen in our lifetime. For sure. And then things really swung in the other direction. In 2021, it was a really great time for business, even though it was a tough time for a lot of people getting sick. And now we've entered into very much another down period with this economy that we're in. Mm -hmm. So it's been a real kind of seesaw the last couple of years. But what I've gotten to observe, at least from a qualitative perspective during all that time, is I think there's actually, and this surprises a lot of people when I say this, I think there is more good journalism or in the past five years being produced on a daily basis than there ever has been. Mm. The difference has been it is often the bad stuff that gets the most attention or makes the most noise or the controversial stuff that makes you really mistrust journalists or the loudest voices in the room that are pointing their fingers at journalists. And like we often don't want to be the story. So our instinct is to kind of demure from attention and just publish into the void and hope people see it Mm. and post to a website or post, you know, here or there. But the reality is, you know, we may put out a piece of journalism that's taken months to do, but it may create a very small ripple because everybody's so busy and people don't see it. It's those loud voices in the room that do want to become the story, that often are playing fast and loose with the truth, that for whatever reason make the most noise. And we have to think as journalists, as ethical storytellers, as good reporters, how do we fight that? How do we make sure 
that the best work, the cream rises to the top, that people see it and it does make the most impact by virtue of being the best work, not by virtue of did we make the most noise on social media? Did someone threaten us and bring us to court and drag us here? Did our story get picked up in TMZ and is Radar Online still around? That was big yeah, years yeah, ago. Yeah, yeah. You know, all that stuff. Yeah, yeah. Did um, it hit the clicks? Yeah, yeah. And the other part is people like you that have lived in the public eye for a long time tend to have a very dim view of reporters because you've probably been victim of just constantly being harassed by like whether they were even coming to set sort of entertainment reporters that didn't, weren't very smart and you thought, gosh, they didn't even know like what our show's about. Sure, yeah. Or that then people funny. that are being chased down the street by paparazzi sure. or having their personal lives, you know, aired and teared and abused in public. Like that's not what I want to do and what many of us want to do. Yeah, the – so the weirdest experience uh, early in my life, whatever. Yeah, some of that where like you're being interviewed and they don't know who you are. Oh, sure, that's fine. Very disappointing. But the weirdest overlap I had with journalism and my career came uh, last year. Um, I'm I'm one of the I'm I'm in Rust. <gasps> yeah. Wow. Yeah. And so are you really? Oh my gosh, I didn't realize. Yeah. And so the weirdest experience I had with journalism, and I remember thinking it at the time, was um, yeah, is we were on that movie. Our we had this horrible fucking accident and this horrible Horror tragedy, day. and our DP were you died. There that day? Yeah, <gasps> uh, yeah. I wasn't in the church, but I was on I was at base camp. Yeah, it's oh it's some God. shit. That's, that's that's a whole. I can't even imagine. Oh, it's that was such it was, a tragedy. It was brutal. Uh, it's a whole other conversation. But what happened was, immediately, like that day before, like before we knew anything, journalists have a job to do, and so they're coming after everyone on For the production, or like poor safety controls or something but they're they're just coming after anyone to get the story oh, but they were but, writing you saying will you talk the, anonymously yes right. they're yeah. reaching out to everyone yeah. they could get a hold of yeah. Yeah. but we are humans going through a really confusing yeah. traumatic yeah. tragedy yeah. um and and we're in this experience where i mean this does not happen on movie sets this is no. so fucking rare that someone Shocking. should die on a movie set it's not an outcome that you think is possible so we as humans on this project are dealing with with trauma unimaginable shock yeah. and yet journalists i get it's their job mm -hmm. but they're reaching out to people trying right. to get the fucking scoop right and right. it felt so gross right because the only people speaking in the early days like right after this happened and the day of the only people speaking there was only a few people willing to speak to a journalist mm -hmm, at the time. Mm -hmm. Half of us couldn't even see straight. Like Process we were trying to process what the fuck was happening, let alone talk right. to a journalist. So the only story that the journalists were getting were from a very small right. group little, of people like threads of and light. some disgruntled yeah, yeah, people yeah, and some people yeah. had some shit to say, but they're not getting the whole story because they can't because most people aren't talking to them. Yeah. And And it was very surreal, like going through this personal trauma while getting reached out to by like the LA Times yeah, and yeah. and not knowing how to deal with that. And I understand the journalists aren't inherently bad people, mm. but at the time it felt like you're fucking bad people. Right. Like, do you understand what we're like that you're calling people who are going through something pain, unimaginable yeah. and are in yeah. deep pain? And of course they're like, you know, whatever, like they try and be empathetic, but like, you can't if you're trying to get information out of this. I think I think this is complicated. I think two things. I think one is, you know, in any kind of rapidly moving situation when there is a tragedy going on, as a journalist, you know, you have a lot of decisions to make and you have to sort of ask yourself, what kind of reporter do I want to be in this situation? We do have to serve public good and make people understand what is happening. But I think there's often a loss of the question, why? Is it to get the inside gossip or what drama went on that day? Or were there signs someone dropped something or someone said, hey, you know, don't touch the props, whatever. Mm -hmm. I mean, because this was a terrible tragedy. Yeah. Or is it because the, the question why should then become, well, we need to very quickly understand what confluence of events or who dropped the ball to yeah. allow this woman to die, yeah. you know, in effect. And I think sometimes we get drawn to as, you know, reporters or storytellers, very much the sort of gossip and drama, much more than really asking the question, what benefit can we serve by contacting these people? 
or you know, who are we trying to hold accountable here, or how can we prevent this from happening again by exposing what series of events went on? So sometimes it's really about kind of framing what's my role here. Yeah. You know, the other part of this is I spent a lot of time covering the Parkland shooting. Mm which was a horrible event in 2018, as you well know, in Florida, where I'm from, yep. you know, 17 people killed, students and teachers. And I covered it when it happened. And then I stayed with the story over the course of several years. And I went back to Parkland in early mm. 2020 before COVID and spent a month there interviewing dozens of people, dozens of parents, children. I mean, I went to a cemetery where students, yeah. it was very, very painful teachers. I went to the school, Marjorie Stoneman Douglas, where all this went down. Um, and the goal was two years after the shooting had happened to paint a picture of six teachers who had become, you know, sort of unofficial social workers or real mm. pillars of support of strength for their students. And what I learned in the course of doing that was so much about trauma-informed reporting, which is something that's gaining more steam in the industry, but is really not there to the point that it should be. And you especially don't see it in the local newsrooms. Like when I was talking to Parkland survivors and students that were in these classrooms where bullets came in flying through the windows and, you know, just saw like unspeakably horrible things that I don't want to say here, you know, because we have viewers watching, but like really horrible stuff yeah. was... They understood the purpose that journalists were trying to serve. Yeah. But so many, especially like local news reporters that are just told by their editor, you better get down there and, you know, bring me something in an hour, you know, something like that. Right. Hopefully not in that, you know, horrible voice. But yeah. you understand what I'm saying. <laughs> yeah. But so many editors and people that dispatch people, there's very little regard for what impact will I have waving a microphone around or trying to reach people who are in a traumatized state of duress. And am I going to intensify that trauma? Or am I serving a greater purpose here where I can mitigate harm to that per person but make them feel that they do have a role in the greater good of holding someone accountable or preventing a tragedy like this from happening? So we can't lose sight of that. Um, and we've just got to do whatever we can to teach people. And I am, you know, sorry that you – were part of that group of people that felt under siege because it feels like you're under siege. Oh, it was brutal. Not yeah. only are no, you, it felt is your very unsafe. Brain trying to catch up with this rapidly moving horrific series of events, but at yeah. the same time, you are trying to come to terms with um, ha just being like bombarded by people yeah. who want things from you, and yeah. you probably you felt only want to know what you know and then are willing to use once and throw away kind of a thing, you know? Yeah, I mean, kind of. It's just like, you don't know me, so no matter how much you, like, feign or really have some human compassion for me, you don't know me at all. So, right. like, you you need your info. Right. And you need it now because this is a big story. Yeah. But, but like, no one wants to talk right now. Like, right. I can barely fucking think. Like, I can yeah. barely wake up. Yeah, um, yeah, yeah. Yeah, it was strange. Even, even the night it all went down. Like our, our AD, our second AD's phone number was on a call sheet that got leaked. And he was still working while this tragedy was happening. He was a second AD. He had to like help work. He had to help deal with things. And he said his his phone didn't stop ringing all night, like yeah. into the night. It's, But then I get the journalists are coming from their job. They're coming mm. from what they have to do for their job. It just meets this this weird human it's painful. traumatic Look, place. Look, it's painful. And that's why sometimes, you know, there are stories like that that I don't want to do. Yeah. You know, other times there are when I feel like I can add value. Yeah. Um, and sometimes there are, we call it like running into the burning building, you yeah. know, and sometimes you really feel you can, but trust me, there have been those that I've said, I'm going to set this one out. Yeah. And I don't think that makes me any less of a journalist. You know, you get these people that think I'm going to go for any story and chase any story. And I learned early on in my career, not every journalist is right for every story. Yeah. They're not. Yeah. You know, and sometimes there are moments like that where I don't want to be part of that first wave that's re-traumatizing or causing yeah. unnecessary pain. Yeah. And others, if that's what they want to do, can go and do that. You know, I may hang back till the next day, the next week, the next month, till I find an angle or a story that I think I can uniquely own and do well and figure out how to report. There are other times when the building is burning, a financial story or a media story or a business story where I say, I've got to go. Yeah, you got to get gotta it go. now. I get it. But the kind of like horrific tragedy that you went through hopefully is a rare incident for most people on the receiving end of journal. I mean, yeah. I've been contacted by reporters myself over the years wanting to know about, you know, what is it like to be a young actor? What is it like to work at X, Y, or Z media company? Sure, sure. And oftentimes I just ignore, quite yeah. frankly. Yeah. Um, but... You know, I That's have not instinct. thankfully had to experience the kind of 
outreach and coming at you that you had to. And hopefully it's such a rare, fluke, horrific event that you never really have that again. Yeah, I I hope never again. It it did shift how I'll receive any story about a kind of chaotic Mm -hmm. mess of a human situation. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Because what was reported on, the story that was reported for me, didn't feel like the whole picture of what mm-hmm. was happening and didn't reflect my experience on it at all. Interesting. So it also shaped like, mm, okay, so when I'm reading a story like this from the outside, I need to know there's probably some perspectives that aren't being shared and this is being written off the information that they have. That you can get, right. But is not all of the information and it, right. it, it really is going to shift how I receive like news from here on out. And sometimes, I mean, that's a very insightful perspective. And sometimes that bothers me too. Like, you know, we'll try and get into a complicated or difficult situation and start unpacking what's going on. And we'll talk to people that engage with us. And we give everybody a chance to talk, especially if we're writing about someone or a series of people at the heart of something. You know, you want to go to them and you want to give them a chance to have their voice heard, whether sure. it's now or later down the road. And oftentimes they'll say no, because the situation is rapidly developing and yep. maybe they can't talk for legal yep. reasons or whatever it may be, or they're just not prepared at that moment to speak. Um, But like for me as a storyteller, I know sometimes I'm like, okay, we got a lot, but I know there's so much here that we're still not touching or we got the tip of the iceberg and it may be a very interesting tip of the iceberg, but the rest of the iceberg is out of reach for us. And you go with what you have, but you're like, you know, like I wish we could have figured out the real full story. Yep. And that's the great pain of a journalist is learning when to let go too because, look, there may be stories that come out over the years about Rust or Parkland or any tragedy yeah. um, that take years and years or months and months to report. But, you know, sometimes that's just not gettable in the early rounds of history as they're being written. For real. Yeah, you're not going to get every piece of information. Um, do you have journalistic heroes? <laughs> Um, that's a good question. (laughs) That's a good question. There are certainly people I really respect. Um, you know who I've been giving a lot of thought to right now? I have a number of people that I really respect. Um, people that I work with, people that I studied with at Columbia, even people in my class that are doing amazing work. Mm. But I recommend that everybody check out the movie She Said. Have you seen this film that's out now? It's unbelievable, unbelievable. And I think Carrie Mulligan is in it, and okay. you know, cast the rest of whom um, I wasn't entirely familiar with everybody, but it's really stellar. And it takes you inside the New York Times when they reported the Harvey Weinstein stories, and that unbelievable investigation that kicked off the Me Too and Times wow. Up movement. And it was Megan Toohey and Jody Cantor who were those two real life reporters, and they wrote a book called She Said, documenting how they did it, wow. which I'm now reading, and is a very, very good book. But then this book was adapted into a film, which is out now, and it is an unbelievably entertaining but also fascinating film from a journalistic perspective. And oftentimes I watch these things about journalism on TV because, like, I feel like Hollywood is kind of fascinated by, you know, investigative reporting or whatever. It's a great story. It's like not, you know, I mean, it's interesting, but like, it's not how any of it goes. The president's (laughs) man. It's amazing. It's classic. You know, maybe brush up on some more of these famous films, but like, Those two journalists are just, I think, examples of, and they want to peel us for this, some of the highest art of what we can do. And then I just have other people in my own life that I work with or whomever that I read or that I love, and there's so many. Um, But when I see journalists doing the best work like that, it really changes the system, changes changes the the world, changes the world. It reminds me. You know, this is why we're here. Doing yeah, that's this. the highest. That's the ideal. That's the highest to aim for, which we all have to have. We have to aim for that. Yeah, that beautiful perfection the highest yeah. form of what we're going for even if we don't attain it like that's a part of life it's like move towards the ideal 500 percent. and, and when and i know see what things it is like that it like fires me up to think i like to get one of those if you get one of those stories that do yeah in like your that, lifetime yeah that's you know that's a dream yeah <laughs> so you're in it for the long haul i think so i listen i i truly think so <laughs> i think i would never like to fully step away from entertainment not just as a journalist but maybe i one day i'd write something or create something i have been very clear I very much think acting is a door that I am choosing to close. Um, <laughs> but, but you know, being in it as a writer, as a creator, you know, I always leave the door open. But I found my vocation in journalism like you did in yeah. acting. And I guess, you know, if there's any message I would have for viewers, it's like try to find that vocation because you don't get um, 
a mulligan in this lifetime. You really don't. You get one shot. It's so. it's, it's true. And and you do have any amount of time to reinvent yourself. Like you really do. I've heard incredible stories of people doing it in their 40s, 50s. Yeah. Um, but your 20s are an incredible time to explore this because you have the space to fail. Yeah. Um, like yeah. you like you have the explore what's on your heart in your 20s. Like go after, like you said, vocation, this thing that calls to you. Yeah. Um because you have the time f to explore it and you have the the space for it to fail and for yeah. you to figure figure out what's next um and yeah. often with fewer like dependents too that, you know cuz yes. you're and that's what you mean by that's space what i mean to you fail. have the space exactly. like you can fail at it mm -hmm. you're not yeah it's not like keeping your food in your kid's mouth exactly you know right. like where if you change and it doesn't work out you know what are you going to do and i feel like we're lucky to have a vocation because i know people who like they don't have that thing. Mm. They'd like to, mm. but they're like, I don't know. I don't know what I'd like to do. Have I don't know. the Disney movie, not to get like way too deep, but the Disney movie Soul. Have you seen that uh, movie? Incredible. Unbelievable. And yeah. I think it's very much about this, like this idea that everybody has something, but so many of us just kind of stumble around not knowing what that is. And, um, you know, I'm just glad that I found it and you found it. And yeah. that we get to share it with other people. Yeah, I'm glad you found two forms of it. I've got mine, you know, you and in all its forms now podcasting, but it's all creativity. It all looks like like this. It all looks like uh, something that's dynamic and kind of free flowing. I, I, I can't do the regular the regular thing. I can't walk. This the is your path. regular thing. That's yes. you know, you have to look at it. And yes. you know what? This is pretty amazing. And I'm just so grateful I can be part of the early mix of your guests. Reed, thank you for being here this and so fitting fun. this in while Are you're you not in New York. Such a blast. Next time I'm in New York, you, me, and Sophie. Let me know where are out. we getting brunch? Yeah. Where are we getting dinner? Where are we getting multiple meals? You know, <laughs> you know, I'm not telling you. You know Sophie has the list. I know. You know, I'm just asking Sophie. She is where the gatekeeper I, she is. of the dining out scene. Exactly. So we're gonna go through Sophie. <laughs> Sophie, and we'll we'll brunch. She does. We'll brunch in New York. Well, I'm so so glad we could meet. Thank you for yeah. having me, a new friend. And um, seriously, I so enjoyed it. And congrats on your amazing show. I know people can't be in the studio, but it's a very cool. Space. It's nice. It's <laughs> nice. Um, yeah. Thank you so much, Reed. And thanks, listeners. We'll see you next week. Thanks for listening to that Onami podcast. Onami is like Ned's Declassified for adulthood. Visit onami.co for free lessons on personal finance, career readiness, personal development, and more, all taught by expert influencers and creators. We've got everything you wish you learned in school so you can thrive in adulthood. That's onami.co. See you there.